and uh, please continue watching because this next session is really a continuation of the same theme. So in the discussion, we can pick up on some of these questions too. And now over to Amrish Arora. Okay. I'm just uh, very nervous because my mother-in-law is in the audience. Usually I don't. My palms are sweating. Say we will say a round of applause, but we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Lights. So we are a uh, hundred people practice. Uh, we don't know how we got here. And we do a diverse typology of projects. Hotels, homes, bars, retail spaces, museums, schools. What's really, however, something that kind of we grapple with is how we got here and what will take us forward. So the practice, the work kind of gets shaped by so many forces. It started with this idea of survival. Uh, at least for me, I left home at the age of 16. I had no money and no degree. And I was just grateful to get what I did to make a living. And over a period of time, our practice has gotten shaped. It continues to get reshaped. And our work continues to shape itself. But one thing that we've been really looking for is what is it that keeps us anchored as a studio? And one of the first things I started my practice with was this, that it was really, I, I, you know, I, I, I have this kind of karmic approach where you will get what you deserve and your job is to bring your best to it. So even today, whether it's a bathroom, I mean, now we don't do bathroom renovations, but in the beginning we did, or we had a school to do, we brought 100% and we continue to bring 100% of ourselves, no matter what the scale, what the typology, who the client is. And this has kind of morphed into a thread that holds the people together. So we try and we are, like I said, we are 100 people, but we don't have systems and controls. Rather than that, we are looking at values that shape and hold why do we do what we do and how we do it. So these values, and you can read more about them on, a, on our website. We've written a lot about how these manifest in our practice. And uh, the next layer is really what shapes our work. So we've spoken of regionalism. We've spoken of South Asia. But are there certain common threads that go beyond the identity or actually tie together the identity of what it means to be in South Asia. And we have over the years tried to create certain questions that guide, that we run through uh, the breadth of a project. So frugality is one such thing. The idea of keeping it easy and low tech, uh, keeping our solutions uh, progressive, but technology easy to access, adaptation, repair, reuse. This idea of durability, Endurance, not just from a material and design perspective, but how do you build buildings that endure, uh, you know, in emotion that people love and want to retain? That's a very important part of why a building gets retained. Again, a lot of our clients are high net worth individuals and luxury brands. Can we redefine that using indigenous materials, processes, and elevate the idea of uh, craftsmanship, for instance, to do that? So I will run across certain projects uh, which kind of take us through a short journey of how this worked out for us. And so this is one of our very early projects 16 years ago in a mall called Emporio, which is a luxury mall where our neighbors were these very fancy stores with imported fittings. And we had a similar kind of space right in that vicinity, but at one tenth the budget. And uh, the designer was Rajesh Pratap Singh, who calls himself an elevated tailor, very humble man. And we said, look, uh, if we could use a welder and elevate him to the level of a craftsman, what would that look like? So we worked with 
scissors, 12,000 scissors, with a welder, uh, a set of welders, reconfigured them to create a simple painted tuna shell, sandstone floor, and a sleeve that became a house for his merchandise and generated this idea of a lattice kind of frame, which became a definition of his identity. It really did what he sought to do. He differentiated and distinguished himself without trying to compete on finish, as you can see on the extreme right image. Uh, it's, it's relatively crude, but very graphic and very evocative. Moving on to our first architectural project, uh, again, we were blessed and lucky to have this project. It's a 6,000 square meter plot in the walled city of Jodhpur with three old buildings that had been kind of uh, uh, used by 11 families at the homes. It had been, uh, you know, altered and lost their heritage. Uh, we had to bring in 40 rooms for the business plan to work. So we needed something uh, that was still relevant to Jodhpur and to the site, but answered contemporary needs of high FAR dense kind of uh, density of rooms and did not interfere with the courtyard or these traditional buildings which became the anchor for the site. So the traditional buildings kind of became, got restored in lime and stone and became the restaurant and the spa, etc. And the new buildings, in fact, were more of a challenge because we were trying to create a new vocabulary that worked with traditional skills and traditional materials, but did not ape the old, nor did we have the resources to ape the old. So our initial renders kind of were these double skin structures with balconies and non-air conditioned passages. And we took motifs from the site and we needed to have the west face openable because it has views of the fort. To achieve these patterns, we would have had to use a water jet process, which would have actually been very fast. But we went back and aligned the client saying, look, the process is more important than the end. And we simplified uh, the form. Uh, we had access to the stone from a quarry 10 kilometers away. We did this graded perforation, which uh, the carvers could do in a 20 millimeter thick stone, which was a need of making them openable. So the shutters that you see are 420 kilos. They open manually, they're made locally by welders and stonemasons. And uh, I mean, that's the result of the project. So you have a clear demarcation and yet uh, it kind of speaks the same language and it has given Jodhpur a new way of looking at craft. And our collaboration with the craftsmen went beyond. A lot of the work we did there was not on a drawing. It allowed them to express themselves, such as this bush hammered wall. So all the surfaces uh, that populate the hotel kind of have this expression of the place, which comes from the people who inhabit the place. And that's a philosophy we've tried to kind of keep uh, implicit in all our work uh, consistently. And this idea that kind of percolates through the studio is that our processes, rather than being determinist and led by an author, are they participatory? Do they bring out the genius of the group? Uh, and, and a happy coincidence, we started rationalizing our work and uh, two square meters of the jali we did has an embodied energy, which is nearly one fifth that of had we done a water jet cut jali, even though it would have done the same function. And, so just the inherent sustainability of craft in our country. Uh, we briefly saw this yesterday in Benny's presentation. So a client came to us in Jaipur and she wanted to do a Haveli uh, for a jewelry store. And uh, she said, this building I built five years, uh, five years ago, I don't like it, can you bring it down and redesign it? And uh, you know, intuitively we just felt it was a solid structure. It would be so wasteful to do that. She, it would have got us a greater fee and given us a better kind of result, I think, had we designed it ground up. But we chose to keep the structure. And in fact, we pushed back saying that, look, let's not demolish and repurpose. And, and we avoided emissions of 1.2 million uh, kilos of carbon dioxide. And we ended up with a result that she's thrilled with. It is an iconic building. It uses arts and craft, and it builds on her narrative of her crafted jewelry uh, without having had to go what would have been a tempting route. Can circularity be forward looking? And that's something Devashi you asked. There's something we, we there's a project we won uh, a few years ago. It's, it's a visitor center for the Mehrangar Fort. And we were, in, uh, we were part of a, a group that were invited to pitch and we've designed a building that actually uh, can be reconfigured. So it sits on the hill very lightly with independent piles. It's a metal structure. And it uses the sandstone as a walling system, and there's no cement, no glue, no concrete. Uh, it's bolted together. And aside from the waterproofing membrane on the top, uh, it can actually be re 
uh, disassembled and reused because it's a modular system. In fact, over the course of the project, over the last 18 months, it has undergone three variations. And because the program has changed, you see, as technology changes, ticketing changes, the technology for guides change, the use changes. So they have been able to open up parts of the building and reconfigure them and reuse them in the way it was intended to. And that's been a really interesting kind of learning for us, uh, this idea of a grid, the idea of using a material in its purity. Uh, it doesn't have screed and you know plaster and, and glue that, and silicon, which, so we've had to do intense amount of detailing to make it work because it has air conditioned rooms, insulated walls, and uh, you know, uh, jelly walls. The last project I'll talk about is uh, a government project we were really fortunate to be invited for in Bhubaneswar by an enlightened client, the chief minister then, and it was designed for the offices and the farmers who it is made for. It was for the Directorate of Agriculture. We brought in the program of the citizens and we, we kind of included the client in the conversation saying that the facilities we do, the, the auditoriums, the galleries, the learning rooms, and the ground plane can be opened up to the city. So we moved the building up. We moved the offices on a stilted area. So the ground floor stays open way beyond the opening hours of the offices and becomes available as an amenity to the city. At a, so that's how the building becomes porous. At a different level, we questioned, so they wanted us to do a modern building, which was air conditioned. We questioned the ben benchmarks of what is comfort. And uh, there have been very interesting studies by ASHRAE and other, on, on the idea of adaptive thermal comfort. And what's really interesting to see is that there is no standard temperature that is comfortable. We think there is. So uh, what studies have shown that people's thermal comfort depends on the present context. You get used to air conditioning, you think air conditioning makes you comfortable. 50, 100 years ago, you had no air conditioning. You wore appropriate clothes, you ate appropriate meals, you lived appropriately, and you, got, you became comfortable. So studies have found that even 30 degrees with an airflow, fans, makes you comfortable. So 80% of this building is naturally ventilated, it is all about fans. It has a night purge system. So it draws air after five o'clock when temperature dro drops below 25 degrees. Entire night, the building gets flushed with cool air. There's a delta of about 10 degrees to 12 degrees Celsius at night temperatures. There's a big thermal mass in the building. It gets trapped in the walls, the furniture, the partitions. And in the morning, when people come back to work after nine, and when the temperatures go high, the louvers close, the fans come on and the entire building is like an air conditioning HVAC system. So it cools people down. And by the time it warms up, it's time for them to leave home. So uh, we've managed achieving an energy performance of 31 kilowatt hour per meter square per year, whereas the Griha SDG for 2030 is 110. So we're already at one third the energy consumption that's projected for 2030 SDGs. Uh, and you can see we've done some measures at site. We validated it. So when it's 30 or 39 degrees inside, it is 29 inside. At 38 outside, 29 inside with fans running, people were super comfortable. And there's no thermal shock moving in and out of these buildings. Of identity, it was meant to be an iconic building. How do you build iconicity using regional narratives? We turn to Ikat, the textile crafts of Orissa, used that as a motif, worked with four colors of brick, and generated a facade which has multiple functions. So it has uh, it's a solar shading screen. It allows 100% of the daylight in. It is an iconic facade that belongs to the farmers and the people of Odisha, and it derives from uh, the local arts and crafts narrative. Last but not the least, uh, our love for craft and promoting that, and we push the idea again. So these are not part of the brief. We push the idea with the clients that can the government be a patron for the crafts, and how do we do that? So the entire ground plane was opened up as a canvas to 50 artisans. We involved a local architect who then created narratives around agriculture using carving, dhokra, metalwork, et cetera, all from the region and generated a ground plane. So that's him drawing one is to one. So there were 50 artisans, six months at site working and generating the craft. And uh, I'll end with this one on time. Is there a volume? Can I put it up? We were quite excited. We were quite excited. Sorry, something. Yeah. Um.
You have been excited, you know, with the quantum of work that could be generated by artists. I know. I know. I think that has been a good achievement. A this building project could generate fifty artists for about fifty artists continuously. For a continuous six months. we actually got you know artisan who had some thing uh in the original school speak and then can just come back and working again working again jo maine dekha hai matlab ye kuch hai sanit sanit ne ek school ye unhone bataya ki dhanda ko चिंता लगा था कि बोटियों की तरह रह रही है। मैं तब तक चिंता लगा था सिद्धि की तरह से जब ये कम शुरू हो रहा है तो फिर मैं अपने लोगों के साथ बैठ रहा हूँ मैं 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 देख रहा हूँ मैं दूसरे को देख रहा हूँ इस टीम पर इस ब्रिंगिंग आर्टिस्ट्स एंड क्राउड इफ यू टॉक मॉल्स एंड इफ यू इवन We want to show them something that's familiar to their environment, and that is where craft comes in. Thank you. thank you so much uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, i hope i can do justice to the forum uh, professor vidyarthi sent me this uh, note uh, and he says the question of distinctive stream of trademark approaches and original ideas and calls it molik vichar where is he uh, yeah and i asked him what do you mean so he says i'm looking for original ideas in this panel and in case professor vidyarthi you don't find it original i can always say i'm an accountant right yeah that's a So, and I thought I changed my presentation in the last two days also to reflect on my 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 practice practice of research apart from the practice of making buildings and and that is what I want to hint at because a lot of discussions were also on the questions of education so perhaps from this presentation you can see that osmotic link between practice and research. Uh, I'll just like to. briefly take some time to talk about my research so this is my since everyone have been talking about the books they have been publishing so this is my latest book that came out last month which is history of urban form and i'm very curious about cities uh, historical evolution of cities but also i'm trying to create categories or frameworks by which we can look at cities uh, in fact these were all the cities that were st studied as as part of this research and i'm also extremely critical of cities and so in some sense it is also a reaction to this romantic view of the old uh, the lens that i've been using is a lens of public places in this case for example in golconda how the inability to create a public place within the city led to the necropolis or the tombs actually becoming the truly idea of public so that has been one kind of a thought that has been going in my mind or uh, this whole idea of a tent city i mean uh it seems 40% of the time a mogul ruler was actually not in the city but he was in a tent and this tent city moved from cities to places to places for almost years to come and then your city which was the the city really is hollowed out it has a camp like feel so when we talk about indian cities there are these kind of very complex questions that we would need to address so the whole idea of temporality of cities this is a publication that came much earlier almost 8 8 or 9 years back and here i was again i think the pursuit has been this whole of course himalayas does not uh, does not see any nation boundaries in some sense it connects so many different countries and i was very curious about those the whole idea of uh, making of cities in an ecologically sensitive areas as himalayas and himalayas always had cities that's the argument that i'm making and also it is linked with this whole especially my studies in nepal my friends are here the whole idea of open spaces or a kind of a performance culture that came about a lot of it was on the questions of landscape where we locate cities where we do not lo locate cities so that has been uh, you know a kind of a pursuit for me for a for a very long long time so i'm looking at how cities have evolved or how they have modified nature 
uh, cities have always modified nature. That's not the question, but the question is how do we uh, modify natures from now on? So that whole question of historical modification of nature has been a kind of a pursuit uh, in as far as my research project or research interest goes. A uh, few years back, we also put a small organization together, which is known as City Labs, which is essentially to help or, or, or you know, you find so many students who want to know more about state cities, but they do not have the tools, they do not have the methods, they do not have the right whereabouts, a lot of young academics who want to talk about cities. And you cannot always expect the universities to be starting new programs. I mean, I come from a university, I'm heading one, but it just doesn't mean that I cast the university in my own image. And this is where uh, uh, we saw a lot of that yesterday. I mean, new forms of organizations that are out of the academic space can begin to contribute a lot more. Uh, we also organize uh, this competition. My colleague is here, Webhavi, uh, and she's part of the City Lab. She's one of the founders. And a lot of these competitions that we organize are very speculative in nature. They're very imaginative. It's this, this is never going to be built. But in some sense, we are trying to develop a critique of the contemporary by imagining, you know, so fiction is more real than reality, that kind of an argument. So this has been, in some sense, the line of thought uh, as far as research goes. Now I'll quickly kind of take you through some four or five projects and perhaps you can begin to see some parallels. Uh, this is a house that I've done in Udaipur and this is one of my early projects. And again, you know, when you're building in Udaipur, there's a very complex site. There was a Barsati Nala that is flowing through. And we said that can we build in a way so that we do not do too much of a cut and fill, allow the water to pass through the house. And the house is really like a dam and I was very curious about dams because they're fascinating. You you don't know what is on the other side. Uh, Rupmati Pavilion also I found very fascinating as a way of engaging with nature, engaging with landscape. And you go there and you discover a whole valley on the other side. And that was one of the kind of uh, ideas that we had. And eventually we ended up with a very linear house that allows, of course, the water to go through. That was the central idea. But also then the kind of experience you had while, uh, you know, traversing while entering. So you had these very blank walls, really not knowing what is behind. And slowly, as you go inside, it opens up. That's the entrance side. And then it begins to become more transparent. And nature, in some sense, is revealed on the other side. So this was also very early projects that we had done. And then we eventually developed a bio pool, a bio swimming pool, where we're using a lot of plants to recycle water. In fact, all the wastewater also is being recycled to what we call as a DVAX. I was in Auroville for these, that's a very old 70s, 80s kind of a simple technology. So this was one, one house that we did. Then we got another, so the, the last house also has this for artists. Uh, they also have studios there. And there was another artist who came in, took another plot, uh, very close to very close to this house. And then I was also very curious, and you know, I think that has been a kind of a question or a kind of a pursuit. What is the kind of relationship that you establish with nature? And is there is there a kind of a the way to do it or the purest way to do it? And then again, I mean, there are bodily ways to engage with the land. You can go up and down. You notice that in a lot of these, you know, old cities, you go up and down and you feel it. And then there are these more, let's say, visual ways where you don't even touch the land and try and just kind of a passes away. And this is, in some sense, I was trying to play this up and can can one house or one project have these two faces? So you enter on one side, it's kind of very, very, very cramped and you go up and down. And then on the other side, it kind of simply opens up. There's, you don't touch the land whatsoever. You just leave it the way it is. And there's just a deck that is there. So that was one project. In the recent times, I think this is also perhaps tracing my trajectories as an architect. Uh, I've been involved in mainly smaller scale projects, but I've also been looking at newer ideas and something, you know, this whole idea of a sim something as simple as a pavilion, how much can you stretch it, how much, what all can it do? And when I was asked by some of my friends in Nepal uh, to do a gymnasium and uh, in, in, in Patan, that's Kathmandu Valley, and we came up with this whole idea that the whole idea of a gymnasium. And when I spoke to these people who want to go to the gym, I realized they're all nature lovers. They actually love outdoors. They love going out. And essentially, they were a very, very strong community. So rather than you know get into the whole requirements of a 
gymnasium that I need this and this and that. I said, well, what you really need is a very simple pavilion that can bring a sense of community and can be, can be you know, just it could be like a hall where everyone is together, everyone feels they're together and can be used the simplest of material that is possible, that is available. So, and do something where you can connect with the land which is above. So you, you really are in a dense urban setting. And I also realized that his needs might change in a few years and it is possible that he might have to, you know, dismantle it. So this was one project that we did in recent time. This is my own studio, by the way. This is in Baroda. And again, you know, I was very curious that what should be a studio of a practice that also does research in academics. I call myself an academic first who also happens to practice. And here, I mean, the whole idea was to create, and when you're working with a small tight plot, how can you create a mass below and take everything that demands enclosure below. And that has also a lot of climatic sense. In fact, what we do is, you were talking about thermal comfort. Uh, some parts of this uh, project are very comfortable in the winters and some part are very comfortable in the summer. So rather than try to make everything perfect, we move in different times of the season. So we have, uh, these are some of the sketches that we had, and this is finally what came up. Again, a very lighter roof, almost like a canopy, that's the base, a big earthen mass, all the earth came from the foundation that also keeps it cool and warm in winter. So the lower area are the ones that are able to take extreme heat. That's that's the local stone that is available. In fact, uh, uh, Senthil, there's a lot of RCC inside this stone, so I don't claim to be you know absolute purist. To make it stable, we, had to, we have a lot of RCC going around, just that it's not being shown. Uh, doors that become like fins for climate control. And that's the that's the central area that is there, large tables. So we are able to move between three different levels, depends on which season you're working or the kind of work you're doing. We also have a pizzeria in our office. Uh, this is an attraction when we have to attract good interns. Maybe you can consider it to be an original Molik Vichar, if at all. Uh, and uh, that's how it kind of connects to the horizon, you know, I really wanted something to get help. I mean, in the plains, I was used to working in Himalayas and in Udaipur, and this was actually the first project in the plains. And in some sense, I'm also getting those memories of the mountains and you go up a bit and then you can notice the horizon. Otherwise you miss and you get kind of, you know, you are all constrained in. So, and we also do city labs exhibitions there because I very much knew looking at the nature of our work, we never know how we're going to use this space so it doubles up as an exhibition space, as a seminar space. Uh, and this is very quickly the last project. So these are the two projects that I showed you, you know, one on top and one on the center. And now we are adding a kind of a, it's an institute actually, it's an art residency that we're adding. And we've convinced the people who are living there to not have boundary walls and have like, again, I think it's some kind of an obsession with an idea of a pavilion if you can have a pavilion and a kind of a performance space in between. So a lot of artists can come. So it, it has over the years, in last 15 years from being just private residences and private studios has taken a much more public character. They have formed a trust. And this art residency is the place where they also want to run uh, like workshops, like lectures, it is still work in progress. And, and, and then we said that, well, the best way would be that we clear up so this space in the center that you see becomes like a performance space and you have this really simple structure because a lot many times you really don't know what they will do with the space will will the use change will it not change because these are also experimental and nebulous kind of institutional practices so in some sense that's that's what i've been trying to do those steps are still to come but we said at least you can stabilize the earth and this is one of our recent projects still work in progress so this is what I had. Thank you so much. Ah, okay. Thank you. It's nice to stand on this tool.
Good afternoon. Thank you, Rahul, for inviting me. Uh, I know I was very reluctant, and that is because I've had to think about what my practice is. And I'm grateful to my team for having helped me kind of understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, I'm going to share some of my work uh, in the practice and also my current preoccupation, which is runs parallel to the practice and not quite architectural. Um, I began my architectural training in an art school. So I haven't had the standard architecture school background. I worked with Angela Endren and then with Jeffrey Bava. So they both had also studio practices. So I don't have a conventional architectural practice. My practice has never had more than about six or seven interns and architects working with me. So it's always been very small. Uh, Angela's and Mr. Bava's work are deeply rooted in the Sri Lankan context. Their work goes beyond just simple construction of a building. It encompasses a narrative that conveys a sense of place, history and values. It is with these influences that my own practice emerged. I'm going to speak about just two projects, architectural projects. One is um, Barefoot. Um, barefoot is, there are the mother and son, Barbara Sanzoni, well-known uh, textile designer, and Dominique Sanzoni, a very well-known photographer. So it was really nice to work with people who understood design. I've been working with them for about 30 years and um, helped them have worked on this site where the main shop, the barefoot shop was on Gold Road, uh, the darker brown structure, but over the last, this is a drawing done in 2000 when we grew section by section, they acquired more and more land and the brief changed. First it was a shop, then we added a gallery and then a cafe and then more recently, another bigger gallery and a garden um, compound. Uh, since this drawing, they have added four more properties. So we have, it's constantly changing and it allows for their kind of free um, sense of space and design. These, the, the outdoor garden allows all sorts of activities, which are really fun. And I think if you have ever visited Colombo, maybe this is a place to go. And, uh, so they are designed, I think the physical space has also kind of combined their design aesthetic and um, barefoot by the name, you know, it's about touching the ground and feeling the texture. The fabric is like that and their whole design um, intentions are like that. Next, I want to talk about a contrast. Um, this client is an industrialist and they, they, are a, they are the, I wanted to check and see if I could work with a big client, with a small office like mine, whether we could survive in a big, with the big players. And this one, uh, was uh, for the mass holdings of one of the biggest uh, garments manufacturers. Uh, we designed a product creation center. Uh, we were com commissioned to renovate one of their oldest factories in the industrial zone and turn it into a state-of-the-art design facility with a global clientele like Nike and Lululemon. Um, the crucial component in their brief was to project a global image and place them on a map as a design hub. The client's expectation was that I would re recreate what Nike and Lululemon did in other parts of the world. With some persuasion, we got them to understand that there was no need to do that. And that instead, we should ask the question, why are we in Sri Lanka and why not use that as a design concept? We started off by using materials that were quite different from an industrial context. It was more granite, um, cement cut and polished walls and uh, timber, and actually a lot of green spaces, uh, introducing gardens. And 
from these design studios, you always had these large windows that look out into the green spaces and connected the fact that you were in a tropical place. I also used um, some uh, recycled material. And then all these designers were from Nike and all these high big brands. They brought all their material from somewhere. They put it together. But I wanted them to see what we were doing. So we had a lot of these like design archive, like craft cabinets that would show them what we did in Sri Lanka. I also used in their boardroom, these are in a de Silva batik that they couldn't miss if they were coming there for any conference they or meeting. They had to be, um, they had to see it and notice the local design. The second part of the phase of this project was a sample room, and that's across the green space. And I introduced these big glass windows, looking back at the garden, so that the technicians had some idea of day and night. And you know, they have this terrible lighting, and it's a bit of a like a sweatshop, you know. But uh, they are all the best uh, seamstresses who work because this is their sample room when i was working in the in this place i discovered what a ton of uh, fabric they waste actually there is a lot of waste that comes out of this industry and i worked together with a uh, designer lonali and she converted them into these tapestries and one of the loveliest moments was once we installed it and the technicians walking up to it and recognizing that they had worked with that fabric. And that kind of gave me a sense of, you know, they are not just parts of a machine. Mm. The next like big job that changed, I think my, my, uh, my work at the moment was the relocation and reconstruction of the Ina de Silva house. Um, the Ina de Silva, de Silva house was, I think a pivotal project in Jeffrey Bava's career. And it was it's it was located in Colombo, and due to various reasons, Ina had to sell this house. And Ina, in her own right, was an amazing designer. And um, they had worked together with Mr. Bava. So we, when I was working in the Bava office, I got very closely acquainted with her. And um, so when this relocation was called, um, they. The architectural fraternity objected, and the Urban Development Authority imposed a ban on demolishing this building. And at that time, the Jeffrey Bava Trust and I represented Ina, and we went to the Urban Development Authority and told them we were going to relocate it somewhere. At that time, we didn't know quite what we were doing, but this was the promise we made, and they allowed us to dismantle it. So that process was huge. We had to uh, engage all sorts of different archaeologists and um, record this building to great detail so that we could assemble it again somewhere. We didn't have a place at the time and do detailed drawings. And this archaeologist and architect Nilan Kure, he had a whole team recording this building. And and we had lots of photographs of the dismantling process so that we could maybe find out how it was put together when we had to put it together. There were like there were methods um, that was used in the 1960s because it was originally built in the 19, early 1960s, like Latin plaster ceilings. We didn't have plasterboard back then. So there were lots of methods that were used that we didn't have. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the building happening in Lunuganga, where it was finally where now it lives. Ina de Silva, um, then now I then started working with her on trying to remember, like uh, the oral histories and the photographs are a big part of reconstructing this house. And we saw that her batik career also took off in this courtyard. So when we went to interview her, we spent lots of time talking to her. And we discovered that she herself had a huge lot of design 
that had to be um, archived and preserved. And at a few years after that, unfortunately, just before we launched the house, she passed away. And it just felt automatic that I kind of stepped into this role of taking care of the architect uh, Aluihara Heritage Center, which was this center that had run for 60 years. And it seemed like a shame just to let it go. So we did, we have just this year, we have launched the uh, Ina De Silva Foundation, of which I am a trustee. And we did, uh, we are doing a lot of archival work. We've recorded over 4,000 tracings and looking at all the um, methods in which these designs were made and the collaborators. We've had several exhibitions and also recording all the colors she used. With this archiving exercise, we were able to recently, um, Jeffrey Bava's hotel, the Benthata Beach Hotel, has a beautiful ceiling by Ina De Silva. It's one of the first things you see as you go up the stairs. And uh, we were able to redo that in the recent renovation. And that was thanks to having made all these records. And uh, the women themselves got involved in doing this work. And this is the team, the current team, when we took them to visit the um, building after it was completed. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope I'm not holding you back from a good lunch. Um, so this is where we are um, on the right hand corner, which is the arguably the largest delta in the world, draining much of the water of the Gangetic Plains, as well as um, the glacial melt of uh, from Tibet. How does this work? This one? Okay. So this is Bangladesh, a country of 700 rivers and innumerable canals. And we are fortunate to have worked in most parts of the country in on projects of various typologies and scales. Um, this project is the, the Museum of Independence of Bangladesh, which uh, happened as a result of a competition in 1997. The, the area chosen was for political reasons. This is essentially where the war started and also ended by signing of the surrender uh, in the Ramna areas in Dhaka. During the British period, it was a race course 
And the, the winning entry, um, of course, had the idea of restricting the, the footprint to a minimum and leaving the rest of the 67 acres of land as green. Um, again, the idea was to submerge the entire museum area below grade, leaving the roof as a kind of a public plaza uh, and, and uh, sort of containing or holding a journey um, towards the tower or the monument uh, of independence. So as one pro progresses towards the monument, one encounters a shallow, uh, I don't know if I can show this, a shallow pool of water in the middle, uh, which is like a black hole. The water falls into uh, the hole in the middle. It sort of draws into itself um, like the, the silent bearing of um, torture and suffering uh, during um, the Pakistani room. And um, so it was very important for us to not have a kind of a signature style, but to have really essential elements only in the design. This is the, the, the plan. The internet is unstable. Okay. And so. Yeah. And so during the competition, there were three of us, myself, Marina Tabassum and Shirajuddin Raju. And we had a kind of a competition between ourselves to decide what to submit. And uh, one of the, the design that I did was essentially submitted. If there were uh, students uh, among us, so on the left is what was submitted and built. On the right is my undergrad thesis. So the reason I'm showing this is what we do really stays with us. And it's quite, I, I guess, important to take care of what we do even at younger stages in life. Uh, this is what you see as you approach the plaza uh, with the monument in the background, but on the way is the shallow pool of water that I talked about. And this wall that guides visitors towards the monument is also um, the one which holds a kind of a ramp within to take visitors below ground. The, the spaces of the museum, as you've seen, are laid very simply uh, it, uh, in spaces of 24 feet high. This is all in concrete, but you will see that the concrete is scarred because of political reasons. This project was abandoned for five or seven years. And uh, I convinced the authority to retain that scar because it's part of the history of the building. This project took us 17 years to build. And um, so that's, that's the, uh, the central space is where the water is falling from above. And here there are no displays. Um, so in the silence of the falling water and in, in, in the light being washed uh, through the water, one may remember those fallen known and unknown. And one takes either the ramps or the stairs back to uh, the plaza above and moves on towards um, the monument. It is, of course, a popular place um, for all types of activities. The monument itself is of glass. The, our material of choice was light, and the only material that could hold light was glass. And glass was not used for its properties of reflection or uh, transparency but rather for its property of refraction. And so uh, pieces of glass, um, 75 mil uh, wide and 19 mil thick, were sort of laid on top of each other using technical adhesive, which is a glass clear silicone, and made into preformed panels, which then went onto a vertical space frame. It may sound a little bit technical because it is. Um, and then uh, this, uh, the glass is ultra clear, low chromium, low iron glass, and then uh, held very minimally, as you can see. And then during the day, the light refracts variously, but more importantly, during the night, it becomes a beacon. This is a photograph by myself. It's not Photoshop, and uh, so is this. And then uh, it becomes a kind of a, a beacon really in the city because we have projected the light towards the sky. We work quite a lot um, in the rural areas. Uh, this is in a flood-prone area to save uh, those affected uh, from yearly flooding. Uh, so instead of trying to raise individual houses, we actually raise the entire village. This is a project we have been working on since 2005 with repeatable models. We have built 22 so far. Two have been damaged, but uh, the rest live um, with their uh, inhabitants. The reason we chose this as opposed to buildings which don't work in a flood and where you know there's eddy currents and whirlpools, 
um, is also because we can save the cattle and and little toddlers and babies. And so the question may be uh, whether this is architecture. For me, anything under the sun that touches human and natural lives is architecture. This is a learning center uh, in the north of the country, also in a flood prone zone, uh, which was recognized by the Aga Khan Awards in 2016. We have done now a couple of uh, university campuses. This is one of them, again, all naturally uh, ventilated and lit uh, with a lot of porosity. Uh, we are just completing a um, uh, art center and sculpture park in the northeast of the country for the Samdani Art Foundation, uh, who are responsible for the Dhaka Art Summit, arguably one of the most important voices in this region uh, in, in culture and art. Uh, so some very famous artists are scheduled to come and live here. This is um, more completed now. Um, we have done also a set of five mosques, uh, each different. Um, this is the second one. Uh, this is in red concrete, not painted, but uh, inherently uh, red. Uh, this is in Dhaka, in a tight urban plot uh, for four and a half thousand worshippers. So it's a multi-level one. And this is just the opposite. It's a very small kind of a prayer room in a remote village. This is where we live, and it's an apartment, but again, um, open to the elements. Uh, the last project is, is a hospital that we have done close to the border with India. It's in a very remote area. It's, um, uh, it took us a day to get to the site when we were constructing it. Uh, this is a photo of the, what the delta looks like. The question may be, is it the water in the land or land in the water? And for us also, it's a very similar kind of a liquid aqueous landscape that we found ourselves working in. But amazingly, when I first went there, I saw that people were buying water. So there's a lot of water, there's water everywhere, really the cliche, but not a drop to drink. The reason was, although we were 65 kilometers from the bay, because of this rising sea levels, the surface water as well as the underground water up to a depth of 1,200 feet was unusable. And if there's anybody, you know, naysayers among us who think climate change is not real, they, all they have to do is come here. And as you can see, the water on top that you see, these all used to be just uh, cultivable land. Now these are all shrimp farms because of the salinity uh, in the soil and in the water. I will not go into the, the plan. Uh, the a hospital, as you know, is a machine for medical care with the highest possible efficiency and efficacy. And that's what we tried to achieve. Um, but uh, one of the most important things from the very beginning was to the separation of the outpatient and inpatient departments. And because the site was linear, instead of having a kind of a fence or a wall dividing that space, uh, that narrow space, we introduced a canal so that one couldn't sort of go from one to the other, but could share the courtyards and the spaces. And uh, of course, the canal, through the canal, we collect each and every drop of rainfall that falls within the campus because water there is more valuable than we can believe. We also turn the buildings to face the sun and the direction of wind flow and uh, introduce a lot of pavilions and, and open forms to take care or take advantage of, of that breeze and the, uh, the microclimatic cooling. And all excess water is collected in a natural pool which was existing in the front of the site. Uh, all the corridors are deep, uh, at least 10 feet deep um, for uh, to prevent direct solar heat gain and also for driving rain. But uh, uh, the, all the corridors, again, are single loaded. And uh, we followed a very strict uh, kind of a regimen of zoning. So in one direction is public, inpatient, and then restricted and service. And in another direction, it's residential, outpatient, inpatient. But we also introduced a very long service corridor all along the length of the, of the project so that nurses and doctors could access each and every space without uh, any conflict with uh, uh, patient's flow. And all those spaces, for example, operating rooms which needed mandatory air conditioning were placed in areas of wind shadow. And now, as I said, as we turn the buildings to face the sun and the wind, our courtyards, which, which are all over the place, were becoming sort of uh, fractured. And we made sure that 
if you stand in any one of those courtyards, you would really feel that you're in an orthogonal kind of uh, uh, space. And what that resulted in is surprising forms in the periphery, which was, of course, a welcome discovery. Uh, the palette of materials is kept very short. It's local handmade bricks, locally sourced mahogany wood, and the, the, just the concrete floor is just polished. Uh, the same material is applied throughout. Um, we studied this in great detail using large-scale models in the office to arrive at, at the solutions uh, of using uh, natural light and ventilation and to arrive at a kind of an internal landscape um, where the water sort of uh, defines uh, passages and directions of flow. And the water tower, which is also houses um, the filtration system, um, uh, is a kind of a pivot around which the hospital sort of uh, is articulated. And we wanted to quieten our spaces as we realized that in medical care, people go not for the architecture, but of course for the medical care. But as one is recuperating, I think this, this power of architectural spaces to heal is immense. And that's what we try to do using all those, um, all the things that we know. And all the spaces overlook a courtyard or a, a visual relief and including residential areas and of course water as relief as well. So essentially what we have inside is a miniaturization of the Be Bengal Delta outside. To, to finish, I think if we talk, talk about care, we really, it's the uh, two sides of the same coin, the care for humanity and care for the natural world. And after decades of this signature architecture of this star architecture, I think we are now transitioning into, or we should be transitioning into an architecture of responsibility, into an architecture of critical response, which is based not only on information and data, but really on, on knowledge and not just our knowledge, but on worldly knowledge and not just on knowledge, but on wisdom and experience, because lest we forget in 120 years, none of us will be alive. And the generation that will inherit what we do today should be able to say that we had been sensitive enough towards the, the, the human stress and distress, but also to the fragile ecosystem in which we are destined to survive. Thank you very much. Lights. So, um, I have some good news for you and some bad news. The good news is that the presentations were fantastic. And the bad news is we are out of time. So what we're going to do in the benefit, in the collective benefit, as Tasha pointed out, uh, not summarize now and summarize when the moderator meets towards the end of the day. Uh, but we'll take a few questions. Few. So unless there is a question dwelling up, it's right at your throat and sort of choking you. Do not pose it now, right? But if you got one like that, this is the moment to raise your hand and we'll take a few questions. And you want, you want to be really sure, right? That's right up to the throat. Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Palak, uh, and thank you for the presentations. My question is to all of you, but particularly to Kashif. Um, all the projects that you do are agents of change in various ways, but and all these projects have a very strong narrative. Be, be it for the location or be it for the context or the client, be it an institution or a trust, an artist. Does this mean, and I quote you, Kashif, you said it's very important what you do. And 
there is there a very conscious selection of projects or in or does um, the process itself you know brings about this change or is the selection of project uh, itself a very conscious decision whether it can or cannot make that change so i think for us i can talk about myself i think we choose our projects of course but we also want to be very uh, open because i think we don't have the real luxury of choosing because in economies like ours uh, i think we as architects need to operate in all sorts of layers and contexts so uh, we don't have that luxury but at the same time i think to to have a meaningful impact on whatever we are doing i think we need to sort of assess whether this client or this uh, institution that we are working with understands or we, whether we can have a kind of a, a, a weightage on what we are uh, sort of about to do. So yes, either we choose or we are very careful to sort of prime the client from the very beginning. I have given gifts of books and, and you know, send them to see projects, et cetera. Not our projects, but projects which are meaningful and not even sometimes not even architecture. I've sent them to Jaisalmer, for example, go see the spaces, not not just the building, but the spaces. Um, so, um, so yes, I think it's important to so understand that we are agencies of change and that's why we don't have the luxury of choosing what we choose to change, et cetera. But I think at the same time, uh, we have to be careful because, as I said, what we put into the built environment sort of is going to continue to exist and, and we are going to be responsible for that. Hi, um, my name is Aisha Singh. I'm an artist and I often make sculpture installations that speak of, interact and critique architecture. Um, my questions for all the panelists, um, I coming from different cultures, different countries, I want to ask what mainstream means to you, especially in a panel when we're speaking about shifting it. To me, I think, okay. to me, mainstream means, I think, big practices and clients telling you what to do and, uh, kind of following a certain format. I don't know. Uh, I don't fit there because our practice is quite small. But also what I have, I think we have managed to do is to do things differently. And those like, for instance, alfresco dining was something that was not happening in Sri Lanka, though we had a tropical climate. So now that has become very popular and also reconstructing modern architecture. Contemporary architecture was not something that was being done, and now I think it's taking that turn. Okay, one final question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I got it. So <laughs> I was listening. Yeah, good question, Aisha. Even I have been wondering, and Pratish and I were talking about, I think it's for others to decide what mainstream is. Uh, but I think the opportunity is to look at it that there's an what is around us is mainstream, right? It's not hidden away, it's not tucked away, it's not something you discover like a jewel. It's something that surrounds us. So, is there a possibility of shifting that that is around us every day without waiting for that right opportunity, a right project, or right? You know, we're all waiting for that right dream thing to happen to us and. The opportunity is every day when we go into work, the way we think that's mainstream, right? That, that, that's what we bring to it. So it's more the way we behave, the way we work. To me, that's mainstream. You know, so one way to look at it is that, uh, this is what I gathered from the discussions with others, that sometimes architects choose to kind of hide themselves or they, I mean, I think Rahul, years back, you used the word boutique practice. Kind of, a, I remember that term still. Uh, it, so it, there's a positivity to that. But also, somehow, the, the concern really, and I guess that's a concern in the seminar, is that sometimes very good talent chooses to be in the periphery. And we find that sense of romance even in architectural schools, by the way. And in the process, you it's a lost opportunity because if you fight, if you choose yourself to be in the center, very difficult but perhaps you can be more impactful to the change that you want to bring. 
So in some sense, I think this panel, the way it is structured, is also trying to say, hey, listen, we are all uh, passionate about something that we do, but uh, we are at least, if, I mean, I'm still trying to say that we are in the center space and uh, we want to address questions of scale. We are not shy of addressing private clients, developers, or even the state for that matter. And do I have something in my work that is seductive for you to pick up? So for example, after all these years working in Udaipur, finally we have got a developer who has 10 lakh square feet of land. And again, the same story, they were about to flatten the land. And we convinced those guys to hold on and we'll give you a whole scheme. You can have your profits. But, uh, and he was very fascinated by this house that takes the water in the center. So I think there's some, that's what I, perhaps I mean to say that how we can be in the center while trying to bring about some change. Yes, uh, I have a question that, uh, uh, why is it that we find in South Asia, there is a copy paste culture as far as architecture is concerned. It is not innovative or creative like in Europe, et cetera, with material design. Uh, and uh, uh, it is not flexible also. So it is a lot more closed, et cetera. So we find that uh, basically the, the, the uh, architects basically use a lot of big brands, et cetera, in there for, for example, for their construction material. They, they are not able to, I mean, uh, innovate on the... I mean, uh, for as far as the experience for the of the, I mean, the main uh, person who is going to uh, be able to own that uh, habitat, you know, for example. So how can you? Uh, okay, I'll, I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll like to answer this. I, I disagree with you. Uh, I mean, there is this whole idea of uh, things that we produce that also have to look similar. I mean, even in Europe, there is similarity. So it's not something South Asian. I mean, I keep looking at the idea of Starbucks. The familiarity of Starbucks, and I'm just using Starbucks as an example. Uh, people who travel a lot, Rahul would be one example. The familiarity of Starbucks is something that is very interesting. So as much as we say that we're trying to create things local, we're also looking for things that are familiar, right? So I'm not, I, I would not, and I just leave it there, that I don't think it is as simple as uh, kind of copy paste. I mean, cultures, uh, nations all across uh, the flow of ideas and flow of information. Yep. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Effort like, yeah, like in, uh, uh, beautiful presentations here. Uh, I just have a, a, a one uh, comment and then a question. And it's a question for anybody who's passionate enough to answer on the panel or anybody. Uh, in the sense, ki hum jab baat kar rahe, you know, of the 400 plus sites, slides, you have seen, there are four or five slides that you have seen, and you have seen, human being. We keep talking about human, and a couple of people talked about performance-based design or human-based design and all that stuff. But there were no slides where you could share. I mean, or agar kahi kisi slide mein tha, to koi poor, you know, aurat hogi jogi kahi kuch kam kar rahi hai to showcase the value of the slide. Other than that, uska koi na. Ham yahan pe middle class, upper middle class, jo bhi baithe hain yahan pe, admi ya aurat. उनका तो कहीं नाम ही नहीं है सारी जिंदगी सारी बिल्डिंग्स तो हम उन्हीं के लिए बना रहे हैं लेकिन उनका कहीं पे हम कुछ वी हैव नथिंग टू शो नाउ माय क्वेश्चन टू यू इज अगर हम वी टॉकिंग अबाउट ट्रांजिशनिंग यू नो द क्वेश्चन या द टॉपिक हियर इज आर्किटेक्चर माय अ क्लोज फ्रेंड ऑफ माइन एक्चुअली इनवाइटेड मी टुडे सो मैं दो दिन से अटेंड नहीं किया बट टुडे आई अटेंडेड सो ट्रांजिशन की हम बात कर रहे हैं हम और एक फ्रेंड ने बांग्लादेश से किसे बात किया कि यू नो वी टॉक अबाउट साउथ एशियन आर्किटेक्चर आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट ह्यूमन आर्किटेक्चर की जब बात करते हैं व्हाई आर वी सो अफ्रेड ऑफ शोइंग एक्चुअल ह्यूमंस इन द पिक्चर इन द स्लाइड माय क्वेश्चन गोज टू एम uh in all your presentation you started with uh, saying that you gave 100% to all the work uh, st starting from a small toilet that you did and then you went on to talk about how you took a hit uh, in your fee to save that building for the jeweler 
And then you went on to end your presentation with that beautiful building where the importance was given to the artisan and the local architect. And then the, the, the way you ended your presentation with the video where you were not there in the video or your phone was not there. It was just the, architect, the local architect explaining. So is this the shift that uh, we require in our main practice where the star architect or the architect takes a step back and then gives the limelight to the artisans, the workers, the masons, and even the local, small local architect. And then uh, to get that impact, which is really required for the project. So do you think that is the, the shift uh, which should be shown? I can't put it any better than you have. It's so beautiful what you've just said. And, and I totally resonate uh, with what you've interpreted. And as they say, the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. You're obviously a very evolved person and you saw that. Yes, it is an inquiry. Uh, we do philosophically look at how do we disappear from the process. And, and that to us is truly, when we are able to do that, I don't think we are there, is then when truly architecture will have its own voice uh, where we play our role and everyone plays their role and there's no one there. So thank you for asking. Thank you. So just talking about the photographs that you talked about, I, I worked professionally as an architectural photographer, so I can tell you, this is a different session, this is a different conference because it's on architectural photography. The problem with architectural photography is the interpretation or the, or the, the showing of spaces. The moment you make, bring in figures, humans, let's say elements, it's it's quite difficult to control. Now, I, I may sound, it may sound, uh, too naive, but it is, believe me, because if you if you know the technique of, of technical cameras, let's say, people blur and people are doing all sorts of things and it will distract from showing the, the architect because the idea is to transport people to those spaces. The, the hospital that I showed, you will never go because it's really far away. And the only way I can show them is to sort of make you think or feel that you're in the space. Now, there's a there's a photographer uh, by the name of Iwan Ban. You will like his work because he puts in a lot of uh, uh, this human activity or this human element in his pictures. He's having a very nice exhibition at Vitra at the moment. You can see that, but he is not my favorite uh, photographer because my favorite photographer is the other, some of the photographs that I showed is Ellen Binet. Who is uh, was a lady uh, from uh, from uh, French Swiss uh, background, but she the way the the camera she uses she uses film, and so the moment she because her speed is very slow, so the moment the human element comes in they are blurred because it's usually one or two second speed, and it's very difficult to control that. But as you have seen some of those spaces you can really feel you can feel the light the sun and maybe even the the breeze kind of thing. So uh, it's a very tricky subject. There are schools of thought on this, and uh, we can argue. And as I said, it's, it's the topic of a different uh, conference altogether. Thank you. Thank, thank you to this panel. I'm sorry, I'll just take a minute and apologies. I know more people wanted to ask questions, but we were threatened mm -hmm. because we won't get lunch if we don't go now. There's lunch for the audience out here, so please have lunch. We are going to return at 2.30, so it's 45 minutes. Uh, I also wanted to say the exhibition is going to be dismantled right after lunch because we have to, the ISC wants us to clear out of the space. Uh, and so anyone who hasn't seen it, please look at it uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you back here in 45 minutes. Thank you.